Um, so a bit of background. Eildon, everyone knows where Eildon is? Yep, no problems, great. Um, <coughs> Eildon under the Victorian Fire Risk Red Star it comes up as very high. Um, and with um, targeted property mapping, which is generated at um, 150 metres from any identified risk, um, we come up with what we call targeted properties and they're people that we really want to engage because they're in the highest risk category. We don't have the capacity to deal with everybody in the community um, because we're all time poor and, and whatever. So we really need to target and focus um, on those that are at the most risk. And this is what um, a targeted property map looks like. So within 150 metres of bushland, um, the cadastre data um, highlights the properties that need to be engaged. Um, as you can see up there, there's about 300 properties in Eildon that we needed to engage. Um, and at the same time, there are some other things happening as well with um, a planned burn. So we decided that we'd get together, we got all the key stakeholders together, being the municipality, the brigade, um, Delop, and um, our, our local VMA, which is um, Vegetation Management Officer, Phil Horgie, um, and a few other people, and we designed a package to suit um, Eildon's requirements. So apart from the information that we needed to give the community about um, their risk, we also wanted, to, as I said, give them some information about um, the burn that was going to happen to the northwest of the town. Now this is a pretty big burn. It was 500 um, 78 hectares, that was the plan. You can see it highlighted in white up on the screen. And it was going to affect the community quite significantly because it was such a large burn. So we wanted to be on the front foot, we wanted to get out there and have a chat to them about that. And at the same time, we'd have a chat to them about their local risk. Um, the land tenures, as you can see, both um, public and private land. So there was a lot of work had to be done with the land managers. Uh, the burn was uh, going to be close to the town and obviously we're going to have smoke in the air which is going to affect the people in the town. Um, and the other thing was that people perceive burns as being the key all and end all to um, saving them. And this isn't the case. Um, the vegetation around um, Eildon has a lot of um, tea tree and, and that sort of stuff. And a burn won't actually get rid of everything. It'll only reduce the risk. So we still needed to tell people that they're still gonna have a fire risk on extreme days, all right? So we didn't wanna lead them into a false sense of security, I suppose, where I come from. So um, we got together as a group on the Friday night, and we did a bit of a briefing session. We used a SMEX format, just for something different. And then we ran through with all the people who were participating, which was the brigade members, um, our presenters, and um, whoever else was there, including the vegetation management officer. And we talked about what we were actually gonna say to the people, all right? It isn't complicated. It's nice and simple. It's a casual chat. Right, we talk to them about their risk, what risk they actually have. We talk to them about the benefits of having a plan. And also that their plan needs to have a trigger. All right, and we try and encourage them to use the fire danger ratings as their trigger. We try and discourage them from using weather as their trigger. Because you can have a hot day, but it's not really a high fire risk day. You can have a windy day, but it's not really a high fire risk day. But if you get them both together and it gets into the extreme, that's a fire risk day, yeah? Um, we talk about things that they can do around their property to help give it some passive protection, all right? How to clean up around their house, what, what are the issues? And these are just common things that you go out and you have a look at and you go, look, that tree is really close to your window. If it caught fire, the glass will break, the embers will get in, your house will burn down. Oh, I never thought of that. Clean out your gutters, move the stuff away from your verandas, all that sort of stuff. So we talk to them about that. We tell, talk to them about what to expect, and this is more around the burn. Um, 
and where they were going to get extra information because this was only a small part of the tool. So we had that chat about the boom, when it was proposed, um, and what effect it would have. Um, and we also were very mindful, or the burn controls were very mindful, that Eildon's a very successful tourist um, destination. And obviously we couldn't do it on um, high tourist population timeframes. So, <coughs> um, and at the same time, um, what were the other strategies of communication? So the outcome, we ended up visiting 420 odd properties. Um, and out of those 428 properties, we actually spoke to close on 200 people. So that's a, pretty much a 50% 50, 50 um, engagement rate. So when you think about sending out flyers, you know, what sort of engagement rate do you reckon you get with a flyer? Straight and bid? 2%? Maybe, I don't know. So, um, uh, the volunteerism officer um, from, from the district also spoke on the Friday night to the brigade to identify other opportunities, all right? So, what about recruiting opportunities? If they knew somebody or somebody asked the question, oh, look, I've been thinking about joining the brigade, um, what's the chances? So we had that discussion too. What were the other opportunities that the brigade could lever off um, while they were out there door knocking and also our presenters that were out there door knocking as well. We had local issues and they were around health, animal welfare, um, MFPA or municipal fire prevention issues and those sort of things. So the brigade could actually go and deal with that or we could forward it on to the relevant person to deal with. So that worked really well. Um, we engage with the community. We actually talk to people face to face, one on one. You know, the guys went out in pairs and they, they worked together really well. Um, and one of the great things we did was we really utilised our time really well. Okay, so in one weekend, um, we went to 400 properties, we spoke to 200 people and we talked about their risk and we talked about a planned burn that was going to happen and we got in there and engaged the community. So it was a really good outcome. Um, and the brigade came out of it looking really good too. People really appreciated that they actually took the time to go to their place to talk to them about their, their issue. And they really appreciated that. So that was a really good thing. And that's it for me. Has anyone got any questions? Yes. Definitely. Yep. Yep. On the so on the Friday night we had the chat, we had the paperwork, we had the kits, and we went through those what they meant. We paired up um, the volunteers with our staff. And once they got the hang of it, because it's a really simple chat, once they got the hang of it, they're off doing, you know, they only did a couple of houses together. And then they go, oh, this is too easy. Right, I'll go down this side of the street, you go down that side of the street, and away they went. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Yep. Um, there, oh. The brigade knew what was going to happen because we'd been planning it. So there is that element where the community did know. Did we publicly put it out there that we're coming around to your place? No. We cold called them. And we find cold calling actually works a little bit better in our favour. Because they can't hide. <laughs> of, of the 50% uh, that you didn't engage with, is that because they're sorry, holiday homes or uh, not occupied or people's yeah, good, good question. Um, if people aren't home and we can get onto the property, we'll leave a pack that says, sorry we missed you, you live in a high risk area, here's some information um, and here's some stuff about the burn that's going to happen in your area and where you can find out more information. So um, that's generally the other 50%.
there was about 17 or 20 houses that we actually couldn't get onto the property for one reason or another. You know, it might have, you know, trespassers will be shot, we don't go there. <laughs> might have this biggest, scariest dog, don't go there. All right, but we try and get to as many places as we can. So there are some properties that we just can't get to. Yes? We did it all in one day. Yep. So Eild and Fire Brigade had uh, yeah, about 20 members. Thanks. And um, we had about eight, eight of our presenters as well. So, yes. Yep. Messaging is and, and the building of their plan is based around their fire danger ratings. You need to have a talk at probably a district level um, and understand the risks yourselves. Have a talk with your fire safety officer or somebody similar. Um, understand what that risk is because you know in some instances we know that people aren't going to leave on a code red day if they live um, in a grassland environment and we'll tell them to fall back. So you need to tailor the message to suit the risk. All right? So it's about having that chat and understanding it. Done? Oh, one more. Yeah, did you have come across any aggravation or did that take a backlog on the brigade itself? Um, no, no. Um, I think out of the 2,000 odd that we've done, we've had one person that just wasn't interested, you know, and that's fine. If they're not interested, we go, no worries, we'll leave you some stuff and when you get a chance, have a look at it and we'll catch you later and off you go. So, if, you know, it's, it's about just talking to people and if they're not interested, move on to the next person. That's it. Last one. Was there any follow-up after the burn to determine how effective the messages were? Uh, the burn never happened. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but what, the, and that's probably a bit sad in one sense, but it was good in another sense, and that was that we put in um, the linkages there that we could tell them what was happening, why it wasn't happening, and now we've still got the linkage there that when they, if they light up this season, we can, we can just refresh the, the process. Thanks guys, I'll hand over to Ray Lee. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, Ray Lee Vandermost, and I'm from the SUS. I'm a Community Resilience Coordinator, and I work out of the Geelong Regional Office. So the South West or Barn South West area is where I, I'll do the majority of my work. Um, and what we're sort of just jumping on, it's the same sort of message that we're going out there, and it's looking at the advantages that we can take of Mother Nature when things are happening. So smoke in the air didn't actually happen on that one, which was a bit of a shame, but it's a bit like us. Um, we've got a even if it's a planned burn, we've got a harder thing about trying to predict the rain and, and how heavy that's going to be with weather. Um, so we're just going to talk about a little bit more, just a, a quick area. We had something come up in May this year and in Anglesey, which is absolutely gorgeous. It's a wonderful lifestyle town. It's a great place to call your office for the day when I'm working down there. I don't mind at all. It's, does everybody know where Anglesey is? In 20 minutes south of John? Right, okay. We all know where it is on the Great Ocean Road. Now, it's known for, you know, the, the beach lifestyle, the river, the wonderful aquatic activities. And when I was getting ready for this presentation, I did a bit of web surfing, um, sorry, surfing, and didn't work, uh, looking for some pictures about Anglesey, just in case this was a room that, that didn't know much about it. And it's quite strange, even though I've been working in that community for a while, what I actually was confronted with the majority of times when I put, put in you know, images for, for the Anglesey area, it was actually photos of kangaroos on the golf course. I, has anyone ever played golf there? It's actually a wonderful wildlife sanctuary, I think, Anglesey Golf Club. Because this is what came up constantly, so it was a bit hard to find the surfing ones. I was quite surprised. Uh, once again, making some opportunity out of it, though. 
Anglesey itself is it's very engaged community. It um it has had a lot of engagement practices go through it due to the wonderful work being performed not only by the emergency services like us and CFA, but also by the local council. Um, Surf Coast Shire is very involved with the area there as well. It's been assessed as having an extreme bushfire risk and it has two neighbourhood safer places as well, places of last resort. Probably wondering why I'm talking about the bushfire. I think it's more the engagement side of it. Um, what we've actually found that with that community itself being directly affected um, during the Ash Wednesday bushfires in 83, the community worked hard to rebuild after that. They were fairly decimated and they plan and prepare and keep themselves as safe as possible. As I said, they're very engaged and they're connected themselves there. Um, they're aware and, and they accept the risk of a bush, bushfire. But when it comes to flooding, um, there is a moderate risk in that area, but it's a very short duration of flooding. So they sort of, oh yeah, yeah, there was a little bit of rain on the water on the road, you know, and it wasn't much, but it can come and go fairly quickly and it's what we sort of term as flash flooding in the area there. Because of the short duration, um, the isolation can be in really inopportune times. It might be, you know, around those times when you're not able to pick the kids up from school, you can't get home yourself or you can't get to work. Um, so they have been getting a little bit caught out by it. So while we've done some local um, community consultation in the area there and, and talking to them, we're trying to raise that awareness side of it and, and just sort of go, okay, yeah, but what do you do when? So we're asking the questions back from them and saying, you know, how can we help you to build around it? We were very lucky though in May this year, so lucky, it was just a, a very short, duration of a very heavy downpour and at the time we were in the office working and I was you know it was just just some puddles over the road the local mayor sort of gave us a call from the surf coast shore and advised us there was just this little bit of localized flooding and, and then sent some photos and I sort of thought oh, okay it's it's over driveways how long's going to last those sort of questions and, and usually in that area there it was two to three hours that it was so the picture itself that she sent, very carefully not entering the floodwater, she was quite a way back on the road when she took that, um, it just gives us a, a, a bit more of a picture. While that's not flooding, so to speak, it's when we can take the opportunity that, that some water's on the road, that there is some rain in the sky, that there, that weather might turn into something, and we looked for ways that we could quickly get out there. And we were very lucky enough at the time um, to have Steve Tevlin doing a bit of project work. He's down the back there. Put your hand up for everybody, Steve. You're a real star now. Yeah. Um, so what we did with, with him was we um, had a quick discussion about it. We uh, popped him in with a camera, a bit better than that. Got some brochures, popped him in the vehicle, and basically sort of off they went. Off he went out to Anglesey and he was off. Now, his primary task at the time was just talk to the people flood water you know don't drive through it we don't want any photos coming back for that one but luckily for Steve when he actually did get there um, so this is within uh, I think it was three hours from the, the water had receded all the way back there wasn't any issues but as he door knocked the area there um, they were all actually very pleased and they were receptive. I think there was only one person that was like, oh, I don't know what you know all this fuss is about. There was somebody here from the council this morning or something. But everybody else was actually quite in for a chat. And we found it was because that was the time. And it's like you guys, it's, it's not much point you know, during a, a Fire Ready Victoria meeting in the rain. Nobody really comes, do they? They don't listen. So for us, it's the other way around. Um, we have to really look at the timing and, and try to take advantage of it when we can. And I think in this, this area of community education and community engagement, we also need to step back and have a look and start using those words like operationalisation of our community education. So we have to make it actually a response. In this situation, that's what we did. And so we're trying now to plan that um, on an ad hoc basis when we are seeing some rain about an area and try and have some community engagement with our units to be able to get out there to do it. Um, 
We purposely did not use, you know, the, the flashing lights or, or one of the operational vehicles. We, you know, we didn't want to sort of put that message into it either. So with the opening slide, um, when is the, you know, the right time to actually connect with your community and how to get out there? For us, it's, it's in that brain. Um, we can go out there and talk about planning and preparation all they want, but you know, somebody sort of said, oh, I should have a water gun here and, and be spraying it. People going, okay, do you want to talk about flooding now? You know, because that's sort of really what it's all about, isn't it? It's trying to get, it, get into the window of opportunity. For us, for that area there, it was only those two or three hours. It could be longer opportunities for those here with SES, but it's the same with you guys, that smoke in the air idea. It certainly is, but it's get ready and knowing what to do. And basically that's it. Has anybody got any questions? Oh, easy. Oh. Where they've had major flood. Um, Oh, definitely, definitely. So, so the community education side of it, you know, it's part of the recovery process and it starts with the response. So, you know, we're, we're already going into the community then and, it, and it's a lot of those messaging that we're partnering up with Department of Health and Human Services on about not returning, you know, after a flood and it's not a matter of just wiping down a couple of walls and floors. You know, there's a lot of other stuff that you have to do or we, we hope people do before they return. Unfortunately, a lot of flooding people use that term one in a hundred, you know, which is really okay. So they stand around and they go, yeah, well, okay, it hasn't happened. So it happened last year. So I'm going to be right now for the next 99 years, you know, it's not going to flood here. And so we, we don't sort of, we don't have, I suppose, just that little bit of an edge where the fire services do where they go like, it's really hot and it's really windy and the likelihood of a fire doing some damage is really high today. We can talk <coughs> about storms and we can get in there, but people really do have an, it's not going to happen to me, it flooded here last year, so it's not going to happen again. It's like the opposite. Instead of experiencing it going, okay, you would think, when somebody experienced a negative activity like that, they'd go, rightio, now I'm going to prepare myself or I'm going to put everything up higher, I'm going to do all those right things and keep things high and dry. Um, but they really just go, no. Mm. Yeah, look, we are developing a, a document. Um, it's going to be a bit of a, a, a what now document that's going to be into hopefully all of the rescue vehicles. So when they are out there, out and about, they can actually hand that to somebody and go, okay, what now? And it'll give them just some really brief information um, and more importantly about what we don't do. You know, it's, it's amazing at the, the stress that gets put on the units um, when somebody does come there to remove a tree branch that's fallen through their carport and they go, oh, could you just chop it up smaller so I could put it in the fire? It's like, no, we've, we've got another 50 calls to make, we're going, we're here to make safe. We're not here to rebuild your roof or cut your tree up for firewood or even cut it down. We don't cut trees down, so yeah. What about when it comes to town planning and development of building housing estate? Do you guys get involved in that? You know, we have the long area with um, all the near Warren Ponds, the newer area, the creek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Warrilly, Armstrong Creek. Do you guys Okay, so Victoria State Emergency Service, we do play a part in the Municipal Emergency Management Planning. So with, with the Shires, we work hard with them in regards to that. But when we look at planning for the future with building, um, we're really relying on the information that's passed to us from the catchment management authorities, um, you know, Bale and Water, and they already have that. So the information is already there. When we look at likelihood, um, we might actually advise a developer that we would like to go through or set up a, 
you know, some information around them. But but usually, actually, they're pretty good. And the developments have, have a lot of work in them and underground channels and drainage and they actually do a lot of good now. So <coughs> compared to even just 10 years ago, um, they're doing a lot more work. They're more aware of it and doing the right thing. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>